My name is Mary Conquest. I'm your host for Safety Labs by Slice, the podcast where we explore the human side of safety to support safety professionals. We move past regulations and reportables to talk about the core skills of safety leadership, empathy, influence, trust, rapport. In other words, the soft skills that help you do the hard stuff. Hi there, welcome to Safety Labs by Slice. In corporate settings, ESG initiatives and reporting have become extremely important, spawning a whole consulting and communications specialty. Today's guest sees strong ties between ESG projects, that's environmental, social, and governance issues, and safety management. In March of 2023, he co-wrote with Dr. Linda Martin an article in the Professional Safety Journal about the safety professional's role within ESG initiatives. Today, we'll discuss the connections and opportunities that ESG represents for safety practitioners. Nicola Massain works in corporate compliance and risk management in Canada and the U.S. He started his career as an advocate of the High Court in South Africa and built a specialized practice in environmental law for mining and and industrial clients. For over 20 years, Nikolai has developed experience in areas such as EHS auditing, consulting, certification auditing, and building compliance software. He's founded several companies focused on EHS compliance tech, reg tech, and consulting services. Nikolai is the author of several published articles and co-author of a book on environmental law. He was the founder and managing director director of the African office of a Canadian supply chain management company. With a lifelong passion for all things related to sustainability, he has often been accused of being an environmentalist. Nikolai joins us from Calgary, Alberta. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to start by defining in a more, in a fuller way, ESG. So most people I think have heard the term, but they might not be aware of the kinds of activities that could fit within it. So we'll go letter by letter and I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit about what kind of activities does it include and if there are any activities that you think might surprise listeners that maybe people don't generally know. Starting sure, with E. Sure. I, I think the basket, I like to look at ESG as a basket of risks that needs compliance and management and also unlocks a lot of opportunities, of course, because it leads to, it, it, it starts with compliance and it ends with sustainability and with efficiency, actually. So I think it's good business practice as well. But if we strictly look at what ESG encompasses, it's basically the lens through which capital markets look at your non-financial sustainability risks. And typically, they've then clumped it into the E, S, and G topics, and then each of them have their typical subtopics. So under your environmental, your, the biggest one, the biggest flavor of the of the f- next few years, I guess, would be your climate management and climate footprints and, and carbon accounting. But linked to that is also water, use, your water usage. Um, I think a lot of it is to do with protection of, of ecosystems and the effect that humanity has on different ecosystems and compliance around environmental matters. You know, how compliant are companies and how do they how do they prove compliance around these? And linked to that is, of course, waste management. So I would I would say in on the on the environmental side, those are the big ones. Um, and then within climate, there's the two strands that needs investigation and that's the mitigation part and the adaptation part now mitigation is all about what is your organization doing to mitigate its impact on the environment and adaptation is how does your organization adapt to be resilient and sustainable given the changes to the physical environment that it operates in and its supply chains operate in and it's turned into a whole world of of compliance and then management and consulting out there so that's your typical E elements. Then if we look at the S elements or the, the social elements, first of all, let's focus on the workers. Primary there, you'd look at ha- worker health and safety on site, your traditional safety management. And that's where the role of the safety manager, plays, in my opinion, plays such a, a critical role in implementation of ESG. Then we look at your worker and supply chain human rights, child labor, forced labor, uh, victimization, you know, sexual harassment, that, those kind of things. 
Then we look at things like DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusivity, and that's got a different flavor for different industries and different countries because they all have their own histories that come with them, and therefore they've got their own our own social balances and social dynamics. So it's different region to region. There's no one fit all solution there or, or answer or ratio, I would say. Um, then there's also what contribution that organization has and how does it interact with the com direct community that it operates in on the social side. And then f focusing on the employees a little bit more is about worker training uh, as well and, and upliftment, so to speak. That's our, your typical social element. And then when we look at governance, I mean, the broad concept of governance is how are companies, how do they regulate themselves? That's the area of governance. Now, legislation plays a role in how the company's legislation, how companies should operate. But then also the rules of the board, the rules of the organization. How do you take leave? What do you do with cell phone charges? You know, the basic nitty gritty of running a company, that's the governance side of it. Now, rolled up into that from the ESG, the G and ESG, I think the composition of the board and the competence of the board plays a definitive role. In other words, do they have the expertise to take on ESG? And are they diverse enough? Do they also mimic the DIE requirements of that organization? Uh, then we need to look at the, 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 the ethical position that the organization takes. So that would be your ethics around business practices uh, around corruption, anti-money laundering, terrorism, those kind of practices, how are those managed? And then often forgotten are your governance elements around your information security, cybersecurity. It's so critical. These days. We all work with data. We all work with client data, employee data, um, our supplier data. Uh, what we are our vulnerabilities? Are we ensuring that private information is adequately protected, massive world, massive. We also need to look at quality. What quality of goods and ser services do, do we provide? How do we ensure that we do it properly? Um, and then the sustainability around the financing side of it. What are our policies about returns, you know, about deliveries, returns, quality of the product, these kind of things. They also actually, uh, the purchasing and finance play a, play a big role. And then business continuity, in, in general, that often links to your cybersecurity. But it's not only that, there's a physical component to that as well. Ooh, the hurricane is coming in, we've got high rainfall, we've got extreme drought or fires, um, we've got COVID. How does this affect our business continuity? So you have to factor in all of these things. Now, to revisit a statement that you had about what do I find surprising? What I do find surprising is how many of these elements that I've just mentioned here are actually already addressed within organizations. They already do many of these things. They have not clumped it under the basket of an ESG imperative. Because in the end, all of this ESG compliance requirements rolls up into how is it reported into whatever framework organizations have to report. So that's the end result of the, 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 the process of the and, and the administration of the ESG uh, is the reporting. And we often don't think about the fact that we're already doing much of this on the safety side, information security, business continuity, environmental management. You know, it, it, it's good business practice not to use more water than you should, not to use more electricity than you should. It makes business sense because in the end, sustainability means doing more with less as well to a certain extent, because that means there's more less, more left over for later. So I think efficiency plays a big role in that. And I think ESG and the other factor that, that surprises me there too is the extreme level of weaponization that's happened in the whole world of ESG, a political weaponization where the two different, the left and the right, has taken up elements of ESG and it either be, uh, becomes a, a pillar of their fight against the other. People interpret it so incorrectly and they turn it in some, into something that it was never meant to be. It's the capital markets that require these things. And there's a good business reason behind that because it makes the organizations they invest in more sustainable, less risk of pushback from any area that they're operating. So from my perspective, I think it's great business practice to implement decent ESG metrics. And the fact that it's now been weaponized it just shows you how people are grasping to anything to try and get the one up and ship on on the other party. Yeah, it's about going beyond compliance in, in all of these and proving, really proving to investors, right? That's that's kind of the core of it. Oh, oh absolutely. I mean, it's, it's 
stakeholder capitalism. I've heard it called. That's quite interesting. And I, I agree. It's trying to meet your stakeholder stakeholders' ob, um, expectations of your organization. If you have happy stakeholders, chances are that your organization is going to be successful because why wouldn't it? Each segment of stakeholder and their interests are properly taken into account and properly managed and then reported to those stakeholders. So I, I, I think by and large, it's a, it's a great initiative. Okay, so before we get into more safety-specific discussion, can you give me just like a broad strokes history of ESG initiatives? Where did this kind of, in a sense, businesses have always been doing a lot of these activities, but where did this kind of reporting and um, or when maybe an investor interest start to show its head? I think it's. I think it was a culmination of the environmental justice movement uh, and social justice movements that sort of coalesced and linked it to the financial imperatives. And there was some forward-thinking uh, investment houses and, and 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 capital market players that recognised the importance of these elements and gradually started introducing it over time. So I think it's been a long time coming. It hasn't been labelled. ESG always it was there in many different guises and people have been most large organizations have been cognizant of all of these elements over time and they've been managing it it's just never been clumped together in this particular basket uh, so I don't think it's a it's really new I think it's new the way that it's being reported on so yeah I would say that it's been foundational in capital markets looking at sustainability of their investments for a really long time and it's only now that that all the I mean the frameworks have been long coming and the United Nations involvement in these things so uh, and setting out the the rules of of, of good responsible uh, businesses uh, they've set the trend for sure um, and then many NGO type organisations started developing sustainability metrics and I think most of the pushes come from the sustainability and the environmental the E and ESG the sustainability side of things more so than any of the other elements. Um, and then the others being part of the baskets now being uplifted and given more visibility, uh, given the reporting frameworks. So it's been a long time coming. There wasn't one specific moment that, that just catapulted this into, into fame. It's been long development over multiple years. Now let's get a little more specific about safety. So how are, and you did mention a little bit of this, but more fully, how are ESG activities compatible with safety management? Right, you know, as um, I think the, the cycle of managing risk, doing risk management in organizations, the phases of it, uh, it doesn't matter which type of risks get managed. I think there's a particular phase in which these things get managed. And ESG is no different from it because ESG is nothing different from just another set of risks that an organization needs to manage and safety professionals by their very nature are all the, the whole world is predicated on on, on these cycles of man, of identifying risks then rating them then identifying controls to manage that risk implementing that control measuring to see the, whether it's being effective or not and in so also setting certain objectives or targets, numbers behind it to see whether you're achieving your objectives and then going back and deciding whether it's worked or not by seeing whether your numbers are achieving uh, in real life what you set out to achieve and then improving the cycle and over and over it goes. Uh, so, so it links back to your uh, Deming cycle, your plan to check act cycle. I mean, most business comes back to that. So if we apply that normal plan do check act cycle that I just mentioned to your ESG metrics, some of the names we just are, are different because instead of doing a basic risk assessment, uh, you do a materiality ass uh, assessment and you inventory the material ESG elements that are pertinent to your business. And obviously, we're not only looking at the risk, but also the opportunities and you'll probably know that most of the ISO and certifications that you can do, the ISO standards are all starting to look at risk and opportunities because they want to improve the business as a whole and not just look at the negative side of things. So we find on the high level that the ISOs are also adopting this type of thinking that you look at your risks and opportunity. 
and, and, and ESG is no different because it's not only the risks that we look at. We need to look at the oppor- business opportunities inherent in complying and improving on certain metrics and, and, and facts have actually proven out. Numbers have proven out that companies that do good ESG implementation and maintenance over the long term do better and are deemed to be more sustainable and seemingly are more sustainable than companies that, that, that ignore the ESG elements. But I digress. So back to the to the process. So what we're saying fundamentally, the hypothesis is that the cycle that safety professionals follow to do their work is familiar. They have the tools and they have the mechanisms available. And this approach can be applied to a slightly wider basket of risks than they are used to looking, not just the safety. Let's put some more risks in that basket and we treat them in the same way. We are not saying that every safety professional becomes a, a, adapt, a, a climate adaptation specialist. No, we're just saying that they are good at managing the process, identifying, okay, adaptation is a risk. What do we need to do about it? Appoint the required specialist to come and assist us with this, get them in, manage the interaction, get the feedback back to the, to the um, different business departments. And the same can be said for multiple different elements. Sure, there's a multitude of specialists involved in this, but the process behind it, establishing the risks and then managing the entire uh, ESG management process and, and, and inputs management and outputs of the ESG process, it's similar to managing the uh, safety process. And the other element that I'd like to highlight is that Safety professionals, they've got the benefit of really being usually very close to the organization. They know what's happening on many different levels, not just in the boardroom. They know what's happening in the back offices, on the sites, in the darkest corners. They know the business. They know the clients. They know the customers. They know the complaints. So they're very well positioned to really understand what impacts this business has on the wider stakeholders. I think they can play a really make a really great contribution in helping with the materiality assessments as well, because I really know the business. Yeah, that was actually my next question is that you had mentioned that uh, safety professionals are ideally positioned. So uh, I was going to ask you more about that. But what you mean is simply that they have access, not just maybe across silos, but also across the hierarchy, if you want to put it that way, like the C-suite down to the factory floor kind of thing. That's right. That's right. They've got touch points. Um, across and up and down. I agree with you with that. And therefore, it makes it easy for them to access the business and access different parts of it. And they've got knowledge on those different, they understand what those different levels and hierarchies in the organization often require and do, because they need to interact with them from a subject matter speciality, so that they already have that competence. And I think that that can stand them in in good way um, over time in making a big impact. So you also encourage safety practitioners to seek out ESG training as professional development. So I'm curious, what does this kind of training look like and why is it important for safety professionals? Like what skills would they be developing and and why? Why do you think this is an important point? I I think the most important thing for safety professionals is they need to be curious about the world around them and they need to be curious about the breadth of ESG and I think when we talk about there's two levels of training and and, and self-improvement that we can focus on. And the one, the the more important one is almost the informal one, I would say. There are so many articles being published on LinkedIn and on on on, on websites dedicating themselves, organizations dedicating themselves to sustainability or social elements or the broader ESG. And there's such wonderful articles being published. Uh, LinkedIn is a, f- it's a fountain of knowledge on this front, especially if you start following parties that are really thought leaders because they do all the research for you and they curate a wonderful newsletter that you can subscribe to and then you get delivered all of this uh, information in your inbox. The thing is to make time to actually read through it deeply and not just skim over it and to start seeing what the trends are um, how people how other parties are dealing with this. And then on the formal side of it, there are some universities and some professional bodies that are starting to, 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 to do sort of um, adult, adult, later adult education in the sense that you may have graduated as 
something completely different. But here's this whole new world of ESG that you might be interested in, and we offer some progression. Uh, it, it'll usually consist of multiple smaller courses making up some sort of a professional uh, development route out there. They are still under development. There's not a lot of them out there. We were we we had a interaction with one of the uh, with a, with a US organized um, university that helped us with some some research. Some of the students did research for us, and it was I was very interested to hear that they are going to offer a program for professionals, you know, that they and business professionals that are more interested in ESG and want to actually get some recognition uh, that they understand ESG and that they can contribute to the ESG journey. So that's quite interesting, and I think more and more organizations. We're going to start delivering this type of, of, of training um, that professionals would like to see. So there's no straight answer. There's not a lot of it available yet. But it sounds like there's not a lot of it available. But if you were to take advantage of it as a safety professional, you could um, sort of pitch yourself as, look, you know, I've I've got this this deep structure, this framework of risk assessment that I do all the time. Now I've got more about ESG, like I've learned about ESG with, you know, whatever certification or courses are available. And that might be a good, a good way to pitch to. It would be wonderful. I mean, that would, that would, that would give the safety professionals a structure in which to fill in the ESG parts and see where they, where they lack and understand the, the relevance of those topics and how it relates to the, how people are discussing it globally and why is it important. If you don't understand the why on these things and why they are important to the stakeholders, you'd never be able to create the correct control, the correct mechanism to satisfy those stakeholders, right? So it's, it's really important to understand the issues at, at hand, to formulate the correct controls with the correct reaction by your business against these things. Otherwise, you're going to be, you're going to be pitching on the wrong level. Um, and doing the wrong things and wasting your time and money, that's for sure. So I would encourage any safety professional to try and get some uh, certification I I in this field. It'll, it can only progress progress your, your, your career wonderfully. And it's not, a, it's not going to be a topic that's going to go away anytime soon. So I would say it would be, you would be remiss if you didn't invest in yourself at this stage. This is going to be a burning topic for the next, seven to 12 years until it normalizes as part of of business um but for the foreseeable future i think it's going to be a, a career point of, of of distinction to show that you've got something that somebody else does not going to be a good distinguishing factor getting in on the ground floor is uh yes. one of the an expression that comes to mind yep in the article speaking about the next you know, sort of immediate future, you talk about what business leaders are seeing as priorities in the coming years. And I think there's a reference to some research, but these these items are identified as ESG, digitization, and supply chain management. That's right. So, and then you talk about, or you and Dr. Martin talk about how these are related to each other. So can you go through how those three kind of work together yeah they they it's interesting that that the ceos are focusing on these on, on these things almost separately but they they overlap to such a large extent that it's um that it's that 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 the one amplifies the importance of the other to a very large extent so i would say that well digitization that's that's obviously in, inevitable because we are we're in an age where uh, you know remote work and and all data is digital and data becomes a currency of our time. So digitization of especially processes and ut utilizing platforms to manage the, those processes, that's, that's inevitable. It's happening all around us uh, in some industries more than others. And I think it's accelerating quite dramatically. I think with the introduction um, and the adoption of, of all of these new AI platforms, everybody's scrambling to get that done. And that's digital. That's digital data being processed and becoming part of the business processes of organizations. So sure, digitization is going to be there. And when we talk about, about ESG, obviously that's be getting pushed dramatically. And the reasons that it's getting pushed is because the capital markets are pushing it and legislators are now pushing it. So we have to distinguish between between the um, voluntary, voluntary elements thereof, whereby frameworks get created and companies can follow it should they wish. Typically, there's a big one. The I, um, ISSB is going to be launching a voluntary framework pretty soon. They've been working on it for 
for many years. And what they're doing is they're taking multiple other frameworks, making sure they're consolidating it in an attempt to try and consolidate the hundreds of frameworks out there into a framework that can be applied globally. So I think that would be a, a great convergence towards a particular framework. When would you use that? You would use that framework when you are not in a market that's that's formally regulated. Uh, so a market that's formally regulated like Europe, we have multiple companies that falls under the corporate sustainable reporting directives, and they have to do sustainability and other reporting, which is a large part of the ESG. So that's the mandatory side of things. And then in the US, the SEC has been kicking this around quite a while, and it's a very hot topic. Um, are they going to do it? They're definitely going to do it. It's just a question of exactly what is going to be regulated and to what extent, who's going to be affected by it, and when they're going live with it. It seems it's getting pushed out a little currently because it's been it's become a, a such a politicized item in the US. But at some stage, it's going to go live and it's going to become implemented. So we will have the mandatory reporting around that. So um, ESG is uh, here to stay. It's becoming more and more important. And a lot of the data points around ESG, I mean, the way to track it is also uh, to use it, to d use digital platforms, uh, digital programs, platforms and mechanism. Otherwise, it's impossible to track it across uh, in a wide organization because the elements are so wide and varied. The only way to do it is to use some sort of a, a platform. Now, when we look at supply chain, I think with, with COVID, our supply chain resilience has been tested so dramatically and we've seen the results of a, a non-resilient supply chain when there were shortages of everything. And then in comes ESG and in comes the voluntary and the mandatory rules. And many of them are now also introducing the requirement that companies have to look at the ESG data points and risks within their supply chains because that data gets reported into the ESG um, programs of organizations because they they need to pull all of it together and report to their stakeholders and a component of that are their supply chains so we have a convergence of data points around esg sitting in supply chains and needing to be delivered digitally that's how the the convergence of those three are, are playing into the hands of service providers that are ready to manage di digital data across the supply chains into organizations so that they can get to the ESG um, data points. I mean, in our experience, we see that around about uh, for every single on-site contractor, there's around about five material suppliers in the supply chain of our organizations that, that we deal with. And, 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 and the ESG data points are absolutely not just located with the contractors that physically come on site the larger body of ESG data points that needs to be collected and managed sits within the wider supply chain of the material suppliers of goods as well, not just the service, the physical service providers on site. So that means that the, your supply chain and the reporting on the supply chain is suddenly grown maybe with a factor of five, if, you, if, you, if we believe the number of the one to five ratio. So I think it becomes imperative to do this digitally and use platforms Otherwise, it's, it's just too much information to track and to report on um, and to pull in. You have to do it digitally. Yeah. And so you just reminded me that as a subcontractor, then it makes sense that you would have your own reporting because it makes that's a differentiator for larger contract or larger companies that are maybe looking for contractors. If you have that reporting, it makes their job easier, right? Because they can, especially if it's a similar framework, then they, they can track within their own reporting, right? Because they have to go out that extra level. Yeah, absolutely right. What we find, I mean, what, what you find is that if you don't put out a, if your organization, a company, if you don't put out a sustainability report or an ESG report somewhere on your website and make it publicly available, companies that are interested in what your ESG score looks like before they want to do business with you, they'll go and they'll look at one of the commercial rating agencies uh, to see how they rate your ESG posture. And that data can come from anywhere. I mean, it comes from complaints on the internet. It comes from completely incorrect reports. Your competitors can can paint you, you know, tarnish your reputation and put false information out there. If you do not control the narrative about what your ESG posture looks like, somebody else will. 
and they're going to put you in a negative light. So best get on the bandwagon and control your own des destiny regarding what your ESG posture looks like. More and more, we see our clients and the clients that we work with, they want to pick and choose suppliers in their supply chain that matches their requirement on one of on these ESG metrics because one client might have a high imperative to be to score really well on the DEI because one of their biggest stakeholders are requiring that then they want their supply chain to reflect that value and they only want to hire and work with supply chains that actually reflect that somebody else might have a big issue with climate um, and with climate change, and they want to be, that's especially for oil and gas, right? Because like 90% of climate footprint in the oil and gas industry is in your supply chain and not in the actual uh, large companies. So for them, climate and scope three emissions and, and, and carbon footprint, that's going to be one of the biggest things ever globally. They all have net zero imperatives that they are pursuing dramatically. 2030, 2035, we've, we've heard the declarations by these big organizations and want to be net zero. How do you achieve that with 90% of your emissions in the supply chain? Well, you better well select the right suppliers that's got a good footprint. Otherwise, you're never going to achieve your uh, net zero requirements. So anybody saying that ESG is a fad and it's a passing thing, or whatever, no, it's absolutely embedded in the way companies are approaching the future. And it's embedded in the whole climate conversation deeply we cannot get you know, there's no ways of separating that so yeah so imperative that organizations digitize that they look widely that they use tools and that they look at their subcontractors and all of their contractors because those data points all roll up into their reporting and they need a vision they need to visually see what their supply chains are doing so if you don't have a view on your supply chain it's going to be really hard managing your esg programs and it's going to be impossible achieving your climate objectives if you don't have a view into your supply chain with good metrics and good data. Yeah, and I think that's an important point is you are being reported on. The question is, are you supplying the data yes. or is this or is this like some, we all know how uh, information on the internet is not always entirely accurate and uh, scraping data from who knows where maybe isn't showing a very good picture. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so it's, in, it's in every organization's own best interest to get the correct data out there. Don't wait for your, your clients to ask for that data. Start building those reports, get it out on your websites, the submitted to some of these reporting frameworks where you can try f fomenting and creating a positive image of what you're trying to achieve because people are doing a lot. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the surprises that I that I had was how much people are already, companies are already doing on the ESG domain. They're just not reporting it as ESG. So you probably got 50% covered already or more. Just put it in the correct buckets and report on it as an ESG element and easy points, easy, easy brownie points. But it also occurs to me when you were talking about the politicization of terms like sustainability, we tend to think of that as climate change or climate sustainability, which it is, but there's also sustainability within a business, right? And that's where the supply chain management comes in, in part, like, is is this business going to last through uh, pandemics, through hurricanes, through, you know, all this kind of things? So there's, there's two ways to look at sustainability, and I think they're both uh, important here. I want to go I on to how how those three are connected to safety as well like the the supply chain ma supply chain management digitization i actually had an interview with someone who specializes in the digitization of safety recently so yeah how do, how does safety kind of interact with the three these three pillars okay um the space that we that we play in is about your entire supply chain compliance through the the life cycle of interacting with your with your supply chain and in that we see a lot of uh, we see the trends and we see how companies are reacting and what they're looking at. And I would say, let's talk about the digitization first. I see how mundane day-to-day -day tasks and the management of the data created by those tasks, it, 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 there's just so much happening. There's so much data points. Currently, organizations, they might have a, a clipboard. They might be doing a site inspection and hazard analysis every single morning. They fill it in, and if there's not something radically wrong that they've got to action, all of that data, it just goes in a box, and it lies there for a few weeks, and it goes into deep storage, and then it gets carted off into 
double deep storage, and then it gets destroyed after five or seven years, and then it's gone. Whereas uh, there's a, a lot of technology where these manual processes are all being digitized. In other words, on the mobile device, a person having to do the job will know when they have to do what. Quick access to an easy mobile app, do what you have to do. That automatically gets put in the correct hierarchy, in the correct place, in a management system. Um, that management system then gets made available to whoever needs to see it. it. It influences whatever metrics you need to report on. And that little data point flows up into this torrent of data and, and, and does its bit in the bigger organization. And so all of the strands of safety management almost is being accommodated in, uh, in digitization. So we see that happening a lot. Now, how does it relate to digitization? How does it relate to the ESG imperative? Well, as we said, ESG is nothing different from managing a different, a, a, an additional basket of risks. So what we see is that most organizations have some sort of a ERP management system, an enterprise risk management system. Um, and often there's a subcomponent of, they call it um, GRC, governance, risk and compliance management, or companies have standalone governance, risk and compliance management systems. Safety is typically one of the main pillars of a GRC management system, one of the main disciplines that get managed. Safety gets managed, um, information security, uh, environment, environment, quality, um, privacy data. These are typically the things that get managed in systems like this. So what we see is that the other elements that safety professionals can start managing and looking at, all that happens is they are. that's another risk element that gets pulled into your EHS management system or your GRC management system or your ERP management system. It is just a system that manages the plan, do, check, act of organizations. So all you want to do is you want to digitize all of the elements to do with your ESG because it is just an addition to your safety that you're already doing. So you do your risk assessment, identification of controls, implementation of that, checking whether it works, meaning training of your staff, deviation, in other words, your non-conformance of corrective actions. Then you go and you do your uh, reporting on everything to see how, the re how are we doing and then we make a decision. Did we achieve our objectives and our targets or not? If we didn't, what has changed? How can we improve it? And so the continuous improvement cycle goes. Now, it doesn't matter which um, discipline it is. In. It can be safety, it can be environment, quality, DEI, anti-money laundering. These things all have to follow that cycle over and over again. So if you use so what I'm referring to here is integration and standardization of your processes, just adding different risks to it. And, and that's how everybody should see this. In the beginning, it's a compliance exercise. Risk identified, managed. Over time, the output of this becomes business sustainability, improvement in bottom line, improvement in the company, staff morale. It's a positive, it's a, it's a, it's a net positive for everyone involved over time. If you keep those stakeholders happy, your staff going to be happy, clients, they're all stakeholders, they're all going to be happy. So we see that um, safety, digitization, and, and, and ESG, they all are working together. And because of safety professional central role in the organization, working with established software and digitized processes, it's a no brainer, we can we can really make this very efficient, and quickly scale. And the biggest things that we find is when we speak to our clients, they do not want to immediately roll out or they want to roll out ESG into their supply chain. Their biggest concern is how is it going to affect the small and medium guy that do not have the resources to really manage this? Well, that's why we want to be such ardent supporters of the concept that, well, use your, use your safety professional. Make them, educate them a little bit more. Get them to use the established processes establish software and just start with a materiality assessment. If we understand that process of what is material to the organization and if safety professionals can start you getting good at that process, that's the Kickstarter for the entire implementation of ESG and then the management and then the reporting just follows because you already have the tools actually in place. You just need to introduce the new topics into your established system and the system will take care of the rest of it. So I think with very little effort, one can quickly achieve 
a place where you've got good metrics on all of the ESG requirements for your particular industry that your stakeholders are expecting of you. You just need to you just need to do it. I mean, life rewards action. It's one of the old uh, adages out there, and I absolutely believe in it when it comes to to ESG and the role of the safety professional, especially. So the the digitization specialist I was talking to was saying you're already generating the data, you're just not capturing it. So this is this is the same. It's that plus you're already doing these processes. You're just not, uh, you know, you just haven't formalized adding a few of these in. Yeah, they're not leveraging those processes just to add more risks into it. And then you let the system do it and the process do its thing. Absolutely, I agree with you fully. So in the article, and you talked about this a little bit before, ESG expectations bring, bring both risk and opportunity. So we've we've talked a lot about the risk. I, can you talk a little bit more about the opportunity? Is that in terms of high, high score or good scores are opportunities for business? Or did you mean that in different ways? Yeah, I, I, I did mean, we did mean it that way. I mean, often opportunity is just the, the inverse of the risk sometimes, but it's not only that, it's bro- broader than that. It's like, if you don't do this, you're not going to get to business. So if you do this well, you're definitely going to get more business. So the one is, yes, if you do it well, you'll get more business from one of your stakeholders, meaning it's a client. But if you do it well, uh, many of the unintended consequences and the reports um, coming the, the reports coming back on is ESG just a fad or not? I forget that IBM just released a report there. Um, they've got a, a, a big consulting arm as well, and they, they did this report, quite a, quite a good report. And their finding was that a large number, it was almost half of the companies that have implemented ESG had unexpected benefits in how well the company was positioning itself for the future and how well they're doing financially and how well the morale is in the company. So um, I'm probably misquoting this horribly. So let your readers or your listeners, please, um, we can put it in the show notes if, if you have such a thing. We'll, we'll find the article and add it for you. It's a really interesting read. So the numbers are proving that there are unintended benefits beyond compliance with ESG requirements. So the compliance is the risk side. And the, 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 the rest of the opportunities is, oh, look, at, look, look how I'm improving. Look, look how we're growing. Look how we're strengthening ourselves for the future and being a, becoming a really resilient and sustainable organization. So sustainable is not just you know, climate gibberish. Sustainable means a company that can withstand changes and that can uh, capitalize on changes. Um, and if you position to do that, then you position for the future. And that's the type of companies that people want to work for and that uh, capital, uh, the holders of capital want to invest in. And that's what the end result of ESG tries to achieve. It's about business sustainability. Um, and to achieve that, you've got to satisfy the stakeholders. And hence, you've got to tick, tick off all the little ESG and subtopic boxes as well. Yeah, it's nice to hear the phrase unintended consequences to mean something positive. It, positive it yeah, almost, it especially in the safety world, I think it almost always means something negative, but yes. uh, there, there are positive ones too. Now, do safety managers want to take on ESG? Are there some, do you think, that feel that they've already, uh, like I know burnout is high for safety managers that maybe feel like they've got a lot on their plate and might see ESG as like one more thing and how would you respond to that kind of? I, I would think that that could that could very well be a knee jerk reaction. Anybody that's overloaded has to get a lot done with very little resources. I think that they, they many of them would feel that way. But I think there are two positives that go along with that. I think the um, investment in their own careers, if they really evaluate this and see how much they can contribute and how they can position themselves in the ESG side as well, and what is interesting is it's almost like a, a new wave of interest uh, and there's money behind this because these new initiatives need to be funded. Uh, one of the metrics that we had that 87% of EHS functions are going to get increased investment to respond to ESG initiatives. So as you know, with inve- all type of investments in process and technology, it spills over into other fields. So maybe it reduces your burden on your, on your, on your safety side as well. Because ESG is so broad, Maybe that is the maybe that's the incentive or the initiative that, that that safety professionals need to get their world properly digitized and to get systems in place. That would be a win, a massive win, um, if they can get their world digitized because they also now need to look at ESG, which you can't really manage without digitizing it. It's too wide. It's just too many elements to it. 
maybe that helps you in your in your safety world as well. Maybe that lowers the, lifts the burden for you and it, the rising tide floats all the boat, all the ships kind of thing. Maybe maybe we can have some of that in the in the safety space. So more money will be coming into, into your world, and more opportunity will be coming to you. Now, if you are a person that sees the world negatively and you just you've had enough, and well, then it's going to seem like a burden to you. But if you see it for what it is, it's not going to go away. It is going to land in your department, and you can either take it on and really start educating yourself and turn this into opportunity um, and not stagnate and, and, and be forward thinking, well, power to you. Yeah, th- that whole co- line of conversation reminds me of, of writers discussing generative AI and artists discussing it. It's like, well, you can bury your head in the sand or you can learn everything you can about it and uh, find the opportunities because they, they are there. Yes. So where do you see the future of ESG and for safety's relationship with ESG, maybe in the next, uh, you could define them, but like maybe five, 10, 20 years. I think, I think the next five years will be a period even shorter. The next three years is going to be a period of frantic activity for organizations to understand what ESG means for them and then starting to manage it and report on it. Uh, And that'll be the compliance side. And I think there'll be a slow marriage of safety professionals role into what they do and do not take on in ESG. And they'll start understanding as well where their limits lie as they explore it. They'll find out this, I I have no role to play in mitigation. I can say we have to get an expert to do it, but I'm not going to be involved in climate mitigation. No, that is a specialized field, right? Or I'm not going to be involved in HR where they are looking at um, gender specifics um, in the board. Obviously, it's not going to be, but it's come... It's going to be something that they're going to be reporting on and they're going to be helping to drive the process so that it happens and it gets reported on and it gets measured. Okay, So I think there'll be a convergence of of the processes. I think there will still be a separate safety professional. I don't think they will ever be replaced by a broader, just a compliance role. Um, that'll be in the, in, the, in the short and medium term. I think we'll see a lot of that. I think in the longer term, the concept of ESG, I think, will become normalized to the extent that I think as a distinct species of risk, I think it'll stop. I think it's going to disappear and it'll just become part of your normal business management. It'll be there. It'll just be absorbed because it'll become commonplace in day to day. I think 10 years from now, that'll be the status quo. You'll probably still have specialists that focus on climate and this and that and the other, but the process will be just, 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 part and parcel of managing a good business, a good business risk. Nobody will be arguing about it. We should, shouldn't we? Everybody will do it. It'll be mainstream um, and we'll be comfortable with it. And hopefully we'll have better and more resilient businesses uh, because of that. So there are a few questions that I ask guests at the at the end of the podcast. Okay. Um, and I would like to bring those up now. So if you were training tomorrow's safety professionals, where would you focus interrelationship skills or human skills? So I'm talking about non-technical skills, essentially. What do you think they most need to, the skill that they could use the most, or maybe it's the skill that you see the least currently? <laughs> I think I think getting comfortable with, with the unknown, um, with knowing that many people don't know exactly what to do, and just acknowledging it. I, I think people feel that if they're on the spot, They always have to know all the answers. Uh, And I think one of the, um, in other words, maybe showing some vulnerability and and acknowledging we don't know all the answers, but I know how to get there because I know safety and I know process. Having confidence in your skill set and then bridging the gap of uncertainty with that skill set and knowing you can do it. I think that that, uh, speaking to that and speaking into that space when they get confronted with that, not just saying, oh, I can't touch it, I don't know knowing that you have the process skills and the risk assessment skills and the skills into speaking into the broader business across the silos and across the layers. I think that if, if you if you have real confidence in that, you can introduce a new topic such as ESG and, and run with it. So I think it's about confidence in, even though you don't know the detail, in that if you follow the process and the logic, you will you will learn and you will achieve and you will be able to do a lot for your organization. 
So maybe it's self-confidence in your existing abilities. Sure, you don't know everything, but guess what? Neither does anyone else. So yes. there's that. Yes, comfortable with uncertainty. Comfort with uncertainty. And how do we bridge the un discomfort with knowledge that you have the systems and training and processes behind you? Okay, so if you could go back in time to the beginning of your safety career or your career, what piece of advice would you might you give to yourself? It's the hardest question. I'm sorry. It is because, yeah, one thinks back and you now I have to evaluate whether I did it right or not. Maybe I didn't know enough. I think the willingness to listen to more, to older people and experienced people, to listen to them and to then try and apply it to your career path, to see where, where they could have, where I, where they went right or wrong and why, and anticipate how you can apply it to your own, own world of career. Because there's nothing new in the world of work, really, in the concepts of relationship and how you establish yourself and gain credibility and create your persona or your, your um, person, your work person that you are, and then actuating it and, and being successful in that. That concept hasn't changed. Um, the media has changed and the channels have changed, sure. But, but I think learning from others earlier and maybe getting, getting mentors earlier in your life, I think that is a, that is something that I could have done with. I didn't, I wasn't in the field of environment and safety. I was a, 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 a lawyer practicing law. So it was a, it was a sideways move for me into the field of environmental law. And then in time, I did get a mentor that assisted me vastly. And once I understood the value of a mentor, I then went and applied it. But it took me many years before I realized the value of, of, of getting a good mentor and building a good rapport and getting a cycle of, of, of chatting and establishing a cycle of, of meeting with them. So I think I would, I, would have, I would have gone down that route a bit more focused and, and diligently. That's good. That's not one that I've heard before, but it, it's a good one. Um, how can our listeners learn more about anything that we spoke about today? Are there uh, books or websites, anything in particular that you would recommend? I would say go on LinkedIn and look for groups and people that, that publish digests and emails, uh, like weekly emails. I would say the best, the best information that I, that I personally get is from uh, several LinkedIn groups that I'm subscribed to or individuals that I'm subscribed to. And then there are, um, get, am I allowed to mention one particular, uh, um, I think uh, ESG Daily, uh, I think, or ESG Today or ESG Daily, they bring out a daily email that comes to your um, inbox and there's a lot of information in there. I don't, you know, some of them I read in a lot of detail and some I don't. Uh, and there are, are, are newsletters like that. And most of them I found via LinkedIn and I subscribe to many of them. So I would say that if you are not on LinkedIn, get on LinkedIn. I think everybody is. And then start looking for sustainability and ESG uh, channels and, and hosts that really know their stuff and start following them. And then actually make time to read because if you are not reading widely, you're going to get left behind. I spend at least an hour to two hours every single day of reading about ESG and what's happening in our space. Otherwise, there's no ways you can keep track. It's just too much and it just changes too quickly. Yeah, good advice. <laughs> good advice that I give myself all the time, but don't necessarily follow. What is currently exciting you most about safety? Or is there anything else that uh, you'd like to share that we we didn't get to? I, I try and focus on, on the things that, that intersect, obviously, with, with my job responsibility. So I think the two things that, that, that I'm very keen on at the moment is the role of the data, getting the data and the supply chain. So for me, um, looking at supply chains and making sure that we're getting ahead of the curve and getting the baseline data of ESG metrics in the supply chain and inculcating the mindset with companies that you need to start sooner than later because you're going to get baseline data and it's probably going to be terrible and poor quality. And then you're going to get better data over two years. And then you, you can't improve that baseline if you don't know what it is. So I'm keen on people starting to get into supply chains and ESG data in the supply chains as soon as possible so they can start working with that and then aligning it with what their corporate objectives are. And then focusing on the important bits because you, you can't do everything in one go. Focusing on what's important for your organization and then go looking for it in your supply chains and making those critical decisions on what am I, what do I want my supply chain to look like in these particular EFG risk categories and starting to work with that. So 
the ESG in the supply chain for me currently is, I think, my my interest point and my burning point that I'm interested in and want to move that whole agenda forward in industry. So where can our listeners find you on the web should they wish to reach yeah, I'm out? On LinkedIn. I'm, 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 I'm available on LinkedIn. My name, surname on LinkedIn, you'll find it there. I'm happy to reach out. Please reach out to me and I'll try and answer any questions you might have or direct you to people who can. Um, if, if, if I can't, I'm not a specialist by any means. I just have a very burning passion and interest in this, but I can connect you with people that, that if I can't, that they can help you. Thank you. All right. Well, that is it for today. Thanks to our listeners and to you, Nikolai. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And as always, my thanks to the Safety Labs by Slice team working hard behind the scenes to bring you interesting topics and guests every week. Bye for now. Safety Labs is created by Slice, the only safety knife on the market with a finger-friendly blade. Find us at sliceproducts.com. Until next time, stay safe.